The halohydrin formation reaction is very similar to halogenation of an alkene. We have an alkene, we're reacting it with a halogen molecule, the X2 abbreviation for the halogen molecule, which is either going to be Cl2 or Br2. The only difference between halohydrin formation and halogenation is that the halohydrin formation reaction is done in water. So we have water down here as our solvent. And as you're gonna see from the mechanism, it also participates in the reaction. So let's start by looking at just the products of this reaction. We're gonna be adding to the carbon-carbon double bond. So it'll be converting to a carbon-carbon single bond. And we are going to have anti-addition just like we have with the halogenation reaction. So that means that the two things that we add to the carbons of the alkene will be added on opposite directions or opposite sides. One carbon will get a halogen atom and the other carbon will get an OH group, a hydroxy group that comes from the water molecule. Let's look at the mechanism and see how this reaction takes place. And let's use, let's use bromine as our example for the mechanism. It's gonna start exactly the same way as halogenation. So we're going to use the double bond to attack one of the halogens of the Br2 molecule or the Cl2 molecule. And we're going to form that weird looking triangle shaped intermediate where we have our halogen having a full on positive formal charge, the bromonium ion in this case. And it does also produce a bromide ion when the bromine-bromine bond breaks. Now remember that this reaction is being done in water, so I'm gonna draw that water molecule as well. Now in the uh, halogenation reaction, the next step is the bromide ion attacks one of the two carbons of the bromonium ion and breaks a carbon-bromine bond, which results in the addition of the second bromine. In this particular mixture, the water molecule is actually a better nucleophile than the bromide ion, which means that there's a, a preference for the water molecule to do the attacking at this step it will attack the carbons instead of the bromine. So the, this bromide ion is now done. It's not gonna be doing anything else in this reaction as long as we have water present. So the water molecule will use lone pair of electrons to come in and attack the carbon. It's gonna come in underneath the triangle, just like we saw for halogenation. And it's gonna result in the carbon bromine bond breaking. So we will get anti-addition and initially we have the whole entire water molecule added to the to the um to the carbon we just simply need to remove one of the hydrogens off of the oxygen to finish this reaction and to do that we're going to use a second water molecule so the water is present in excess meaning we have lots and lots of water which is typical when it's a solvent we have enough water that we can use some water molecules to do this, and we can use some water molecules to do this. And we'll just pick either one of those hydrogens to remove, and the product that we get from this reaction looks like this. And this, this molecule is called a halo hydrin. So the conditions for this reaction before we look at some examples. Obviously we have anti-addition uh, the, of the bromine and the OH group. And also obviously we have no rearrangement because we have no carbon skeleton, or excuse me, no carbocation, so there's no carbon skeleton rearrangement. The third condition of the reaction has to do with where the water molecule attacks when it comes in and does this attacking. <clears throat> the water molecule, and this is, this is kind of counterintuitive, the water molecule shows preference for attacking the carbon atom of the alkene that is most substituted. H2O attacks the most substituted carbon. 
most substituted, meaning the carbon that has the, the most stuff attached to it. Um, so looking at, in this particular case, these two carbon atoms, they're symmetrical. Uh, but this particular carbon has two carbons attached, and this particular carbon has two carbons attached. And so it's, uh, the water molecule is going to attack in this step the carbon atom of the alkene that has the most carbon-carbon bonds already. Now, this, like I said, it's counterintuitive because this step of the mechanism looks a lot like an SN2 reaction where we have a nucleophile attacking and kicking off a leaving group, if you want to think about it like that. So you would think that the water molecule would go for the least sterically hindered site, which would be the least substituted carbon. But that's definitely not what happens in this reaction. So our explanation or our theory for this is that the carbon-bromine bond starts to break prior to the oxygen attacking. It's breaking as the oxygen is coming near. So in fact, this, even though we draw this to resemble an SN2 reaction, it probably more closely resembles an SN1, where we kick off the leaving group first and form the most stable carbocation, and then we have the uh, nucleophile come in and attack. Now, we also know that it's not actually not like that because there, if, if it did look like that, if we did break this and form a carbocation, we would definitely see rearrangement taking place. So this is where you're going to have to kind of be like a top-notch chemist and look at this reaction as sort of a hybrid of SN1 and SN2. Let's take a look at a couple examples of this reaction. So here we have um, bromine in the presence of water, and I'm going to draw out the, the bromine so that we can draw a mechanism for this. And I'm actually I'm going to do the same thing for the water molecule so we can draw a full mechanism for this reaction. So it's going to start by having the double bond attack one of the two bromines. And let's make our bromonium ion. And we do make that bromide ion byproduct, but it's not going to be used in this reaction. So I just want to leave it out to kind of keep things as clean as possible. And now I'm going to have my water molecule with one of its lone pairs. The water molecule is going to come in and attack one of the two carbons of the original alkene. And it's going to attack the most substituted carbon. This carbon has two carbon-carbon bonds. This carbon has one carbon-carbon bond. I'm not counting this bond right here. You could if you wanted to. So this carbon has one, two, three carbon-carbon bonds. This carbon has one, two carbon-carbon bonds. That makes this one the most substituted. So that's where the attack will go, right there. Break that carbon-bromine bond. Now we wanna be respectful of the stereochemistry so I'm drawing my OH, or what's about to be OH. I'm, I'm making sure to show that as pointing down. And the bromine, making sure to maintain its original orientation. I know I've got ugly looking bond angles, but I don't care because I'm just really wanting to take the time to draw everything pointing in the right direction so that my stereochemistry is going to be accurate. And then for the last step, I'm going to bring in another water molecule because we have lots and lots of water. And I'm going to deprotonate, remove one of the hydrogens to get rid of that positive formal charge. Now, we do need to be thinking about wedges and dashes, but before we start drawing those in, we should ask ourselves, did we make chiral carbons? Because if our carbons are a chiral, it's not necessary for us to draw wedges and dashes. So what we want to focus on are the two carbons that we messed with. These are the two carbons that we worked on, and let's follow those two carbons through to our products. We've got to ask ourselves, are either one of those two carbons chiral? So starting with this guy, a methyl, an ethyl, an OH group, and something else, this carbon is definitely chiral. This one, a methyl, a bromine, a hydrogen, and something else, so this carbon is chiral as well. They're both chiral. 
When they're both chiral, that means that we need to focus on stereochemistry. So let's go back to our alkene and let's pick two things that are cis to each other and let's make those two things wedges. And it doesn't matter if you make them wedges or dashes, just make them something the same and let's keep that stereochemistry through the whole entire mechanism. So the ethyl and the methyl are gonna stay on the wedge the whole entire time. And then let's go back to the alkene again and we're gonna pick two, the other two things that are cis to each other and we're gonna make them dashes and I'm gonna draw hydrogen in and then let's just copy that stereochemistry through the whole mechanism. And there we go. Now, the thing that we have to worry about with this particular reaction, with the halo hydrogen formation, is the very first step when we put the bromine here, what if it actually went over here? And how would that change the outcome of this reaction? So without drawing a mechanism, Let's just kind of visualize what it would look like if the bromonium was on the other side of the molecule. So we put it over here. And then in the next step, when the water came in, the water is still going to attack the same hydrogen, or excuse me, the same carbon. It's just going to be going in a different direction. So I still have the water molecule on the same carbon. I just have it pointing in, the, in a different direction. And then follow through to our product. And there we go. So there are the two products for this reaction. Let's take a look at this next example here. And in this one, we're just going to predict the products. We're not going to draw the mechanism. So I'm going to start with my carbon skeleton. I am going to be putting two things on the two carbons of the alkene. So I've got my bonds ready. My OH is going to go on the most substituted carbon. So that is this one right here, the one that has the most carbon-carbon bonds. So my OH is going to go right here and my chlorine will go on the other carbon, the least substituted. Now let's think about stereochemistry. Did we make any chiral carbons? Focusing on the two carbons of the alkene, is this carbon here chiral? How many different things are attached? One, two, three, four. So this carbon is chiral. What about this carbon? Is it chiral? No, it's not because it has two hydrogens. When we only have one chiral carbon, it makes things very easy for us. We have that OH group on a wedge or the OH group on a dash. So that, that is much simpler when only one of the carbons is chiral.